This is the Comics Alternative Interviews, conversations with Nate Powell and Andrew Iden. Hello and welcome to the Comics Alternative Interviews. I'm Derek. And I'm Andy, and we're two guys with PhDs talking about comics. And on this very special interview show, we're going to be having two conversations. First, we're going to be listening to a recorded interview that we did with Nate Powell. And then after that, we have an interview with Andrew Iden. Both of those are the creators, along with Representative John Lewis, of March book three of which came out just last month. But before we get to those conversations, we want to let you know that this episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews is brought to you by the wonderful folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off of the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts are 20 to 35% off of the cover price. And every month, you're going to find some wonderful specials. Now, sometimes those specials will be at 45% off cover price. Sometimes those extra specials will be at 50% off cover. But often, you can find discounts that go higher than that. That's right. And since we're talking to the creators of March on this episode, uh, you can check out at DCBService.com and you can find the oversized edition of March Book One for 35% off at 1949. You can find March Book Three, which came out last month at 35% off for 1299 and a very nice March trilogy slipcase set. Uh, for 35% off at 32.49. So if you listen to this episode and you're interested in checking out March and you haven't yet, uh, you can find it at a good price on Discount Comic Book Service. And in fact, we can almost guarantee you, you cannot find it at a better price than Discount Comic Book Service. <laughs> so go to their website, dcbservice.com. They'll take care of all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do get your March books there, please be sure to send them an email and tell them that the two guys with PhDs sent you. That's right. Well, Andy, this is uh, something different. Uh, we've never done anything like this. We've never interviewed two creators separately and then bring those interviews together in one show. But we were able to do it this time around with Nate Powell and Andrew Iden. Yeah, and uh, these were both great conversations. And it, it was great to have this opportunity to talk to these two creators of, of March, which is such a significant work. And this is... I think one of the interviews that um, I'm most proud to be a part of uh, with this podcast. Yeah, I agree. This uh, this is an important book. Uh, the third book in the trilogy wrapped up just last month. Uh, the only thing that could make this better is to have Congressman Lewis on the show. But, you know, this guy, he's a congressman. He's busy. He's got other <laughs> things to do besides talking with a couple of guys who talk about comics. Uh, but we had great no. conversations with Andrew and Nate. So let's go ahead and get to those. Yep. We're here today with Nate Powell, the artist on the March series of graphic novels, which has just concluded with volume three. So thanks for joining us, Nate. Oh, thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah, welcome to the Comics Alternative. Uh, I, I want to say that, Nate, I saw you, Andrew, and Representative Lewis on Rachel Maddow last week when the book first came out. Uh, now, we may not have the reach of a Rachel Maddow, uh, but I can almost assure you that our listeners are going to be much more familiar with your <laughs> comics sure than thing. Rachel's. Uh, so w one of the places I wanted to start was actually – um, at the end of volume three was one of the things that struck me when I got to the end is that you know, when you sign that final page, you also put the date range in which this project, this March project has been going on from 2009 to 2016. 
And, you know, there's kind of two levels to what I want to ask here. One is that, you know, what struck me by that, first of all, was that that's that's the entire the entirety of President Obama's presidency right uh, in there. And that that you, you use that very well to frame, you know, the the inauguration frames the the narrative. And so his presidency historically kind of frames the production of this book as well. But also it made me wonder about just kind of from your end, you know, professionally, creatively uh, spending seven, eight years on a project is is kind of huge, daunting task. So what was that like getting to the end of this project after all that time? Well, it was in especially books two and three were intensive and uh, the timeline for producing it was was pressing enough that uh yeah i finished work i think at the around may 25th and it took a solid month before just speaking for myself before i i got a feeling of being a normal functional human being <laughs> and then it took another month i'd say by the time we went to san diego comic con uh that was before that was about when andrew and lee and i all started really feeling like we were coming out of our shells again so there was definitely a period in which we just kind of retreated to to lick our wounds um now i started work on march i think i had tried out around October or November of 2011. Mm-hmm. So Andrew and Congressman Lewis had been working on uh, writing it and doing interviews and research and doing the script elements for a couple of years before then. Um, so I'd say, yeah, for these last four and a half years, at least in which I've been actively working on the book, um, originally it was just going to be one big brick of a book. Um, and the script originally – looked like it was going to be about a 280 page book. But as soon as I kind of stepped in and started breaking down the pages, according to my own storytelling, uh, sensibilities, I realized it would be about twice that length. So at comic con 2012, Andrew and I just very, you know, casually decided it would be a better idea to divide it into three books at the natural breaking points and just kind of take the pressure off. But at that point we had no idea what, the future would hold, you know, what the scope or scale of the book was, what the reception to us, it was just like, Oh, let's just let's take it easy. We didn't realize it was a good idea from a marketing standpoint or an educational standpoint. None of that was a consideration. We're like, okay, this is a big, big book. Let's just break it up and make it seem a little more manageable. Well, from your perspective, you're talking about not knowing what kind of reception the project would get. Um, from, from your standpoint, when did it kick in? When did you realize that this is something that was really going to take off? Well, it's, the first time we had a, a sense that that it was going to be outside of at least my range of experience – uh, was when the first book debuted, I guess when the first book debuted at San Diego Comic Con in 2013. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of it had to do simply with, <clears throat> it was my first time to speak about a book that I was directly working on in one of those larger halls at San Diego uh, without being on a multi-person panel speaking about you know a variety of different books. Um, but it was the, it was, there was something about the signing lines. They were... You know, there were huge lines, but it was the makeup of those lines. It was the fact that it was predominantly family. It was like parents who had brought all of their kids. It was teachers who had brought their entire class, um, librarians who had brought a gaggle of other people with them. I, I could I could sense that this was something that even from the starting gate, people were responding to in a word of mouth way. It was like, oh, you need to come check this out. You definitely need to meet the man himself, uh, Congressman Lewis. Um, but people would read the book because of, you know the first book was relatively short. A lot of folks would be like, "Oh, I just finished it." Well, I was standing in line uh, <laughs> signing, which actually worked out well because people would arrive at the signing on the day it was released uh, with questions and comments, and it was engaging from the from the get go. But It took another couple of months before we realized that we had a whole new set of challenges in which, you know, teachers were starting to incorporate it in their classrooms for history, for English, as a memoir, 
you know, as, as a piece of fine art and commercial art. Um, so simply by being used as a history book very quickly, uh, as we were working, starting work on that second book, we realized we had to learn exactly what rules we needed to follow to continue to be accepted in schools. Uh, and basically we gave ourselves a crash course in the way that, you know, teachers guidelines and historical guidelines work to stay within those boundaries. Uh, and I, th- I'd say that was the biggest shift between books one and two was kind of stepping up to the, to the precedent that this was already being incorporated in schools. That what you just described there is interesting because I, I got to sort of experience what you were describing there from the other end in that I, I went, I got to see you and uh, Andrew and, and Congressman Lewis at Ohio state. Oh, awesome. Um, I think that was around the time book two came out, uh, yeah. got, got in line to get signed and was, you know, way in the back and people came up and said, yeah, you're never, you're never making it to the front of the line. Uh, so, so unfortunately had to step out. Oh man. <laughs> but the, uh, the, um, that experience, I mean, you, I don't know how much you remember of, of that particular event. You, you were pretty oh, hoarse. Your voice yeah. was kind of shot. <laughs> yeah. Um, I remember very well in, in that I could not speak whatsoever. Uh, <laughs> and I was, uh, you know, it, I was wondering what that that whole the kind of tour was like, but also more more specifically, uh, sitting in the audience and listening to Representative Lewis speak was such an emotional experience for me as an audience member. Um, and I just wondered what is what was that like to experience that on a kind of constant basis? Oh yeah, well, <clears throat> I mean that. That's something that continues, and we've probably spoken together over a hundred times. But still, every single time, even though these are stories that I've now heard into the triple digits, <laughs> virtually every time I I discover that I'm getting I'm getting teary, I'm being deeply moved. Uh, every once in a while, you know, a, you'll get the gem where um, in his recalling of a certain anecdote or a certain tale, he'll inject uh, some new side note or some new detail, which sort of broadens the scene. And it's interesting. A lot of times, you know, having already drawn certain things and put it in March, I'm like, Oh, would have been good to know a while ago, but very interesting. (laughs) Um, he has an amazing memory. So like his capacity to dig into this well of memory, uh, you know, is always, is, is always amazing. But yeah, I mean, he's just a, he's a very genuine, a very genuine fellow. And so, yeah, it never, it never gets old. I never get, you know, cynical or burned out, uh, at our touring schedule. It's always a pleasure to hear him speak and especially to just to feel the energy from, you know, all the people who have come to see him. So Nate, I wanted to ask you about your role in this project and and actually how it came about. Uh, you know, Andy referenced the very last page of book three, where you include the dates. But you know, also on that last page is a little clue about the birth of March, where Andrew is talking with Representative Lewis. Uh, you know, right after the inauguration of President Obama. And Lewis mentioned something about the comic book idea, and, and that's a little clue into what you mentioned earlier, that this is something that the two of them had been discussing previously. Oh, yeah. uh, but then Representative Lewis says uh, that he wants to go forward with this. He says, we'll have to find a great artist, someone who can make the words sing. So I guess you're the singer here. Um, at, at what point did they come to you with this idea? And from, from what you know, how did they come to you? Well, <clears throat> they spent at least two years just in isolation working up what the book was actually going to be, ultimately arriving upon a script. And I remember, I can't remember if it was early or mid-2011, I remember Top Shelf releasing a press release about March. And there's a picture of Staros with the two co-writers. And I remember reading it and being like, oh, what an interesting idea. Uh, but I, my brain just completely overlooked the fact that there was no artist attached to the project and thus connecting the dots that they needed one. So I was like, oh, cool. And then I went back to working on the books I was doing. And then a few weeks later, 
uh, I got a call from Chris Staros, uh, who's like, hey, man, I don't know if you if you read our press release about this book, March, but he strongly suggested that I try out for the job. Uh, but it, to that end, it really came down to, uh, just like with any other project, you know, directly uh, trying out to Andrew and Congressman Lewis. So they sent me a couple of sample pages of script. I did some sample pages off of that. I got notes. Uh, and corrections from them, and I redrew those and resubmitted them. And then, really, only in about two weeks, we realized that this was going to be a really solid team. So it was kind of a, it was a very, a very quick process of uh, deciding to take a chance on me, and I'm very grateful for that. So I think that was a that was probably around October of 2011 when I signed on officially. So what was it? The um, your your book, The Silence of Our uh, of Our Friends, that may have like kind of put you into that place to be considered for this it wasn't but uh indirectly it kind of helped seal the deal for from congressman lewis's end so silence of our friends didn't come out until january 2012 okay and so i hadn't started penciling march yet but i had already signed on and um the way andrew tells it uh i think it was the week after they had sent off something for me to get started on in some way. Um, and there was a, a New York Times review or article about the silence of our friends that had an unusually large amount of artwork, relatively mm-hmm. speaking, from the, from silence that was in the Times. And I, apparently Congressman Lewis was like, Andrew, what was the name of that artist we got for March? And he's like, oh, Nate Powell. And he's like, this Nate Powell? <laughs> and he's like, oh, yeah, that, that's him. He's like, well, He's like, all right, well, you know, it's a good sign in that I've never seen this much comic book art in a book review in the New York Times. So <laughs> thumbs up. And that kind of helped uh, establish, you know, a, a little bit more faith and trust, you know, from the from the get go. Because I'd wondered about the timing of all of that. I remember when The Silence of Our Friends came out and then, you know, it wasn't. Uh, until well, I guess that next year, right? That uh, March Book One came out. So I, even though the silence of our friends wasn't the initial way into the March project, I, I would guess that it did put you in a particular frame of mind. Uh, oh yes, uh, as did I would guess your own experiences growing up in Arkansas. Yeah, you bet. Um, yeah, in terms of silence. Um, Really, from a from a formal and practical level, the couple of years I spent drawing Silence of Our Friends and really learning how to dive into a, what is essentially a nonfiction period piece, uh, how to do basic levels of research, but really developing an eye for like the styles, the technologies, the buildings, uh, environmental factors uh, that I would need to find reference for. Uh, and, and, and that's also the book where I started using my, uh, gray wash method on top of the line art. There were just a lot of components there that I worked out. I was fortunate enough to work out before I got bored on March on board with March. So when it came time to actually draw March, I was really able to kind of hit the ground running and I didn't have any time I had to spend kind of working out my aesthetic. I already knew what it was going to be. Um, but yeah, there were, there were a lot of components, you know, like, yeah, I'm from Arkansas. Uh, I also spent my elementary school years living in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, mm-hmm. from 83 to 88. And my parents are all from, they're both from Northern Mississippi and they grew up as baby boomers, you know, at the tail end of the Jim Crow South. Um, and so whenever possible, uh, it was nice to find a space in which I could, dig into my own memory, uh, whether that was simply the environmental memory of what, you know, mid Alabama was like, or, you know, moving throughout the deep South, uh, with silence of our friends, that was where I was able to take Arkansas's landscape and sort of, you know, move it over a little bit so that it was in Texas and, and sort of recognize where and how to move around in my mind's eye and what was fair to include. Uh, but whenever possible, yeah, I tried to, make the landscapes within March as much my own as I could. And there were moments where I recognized the precise location. I had been there. I'd grown up there. Um, my house in Montgomery was actually like just a quarter mile away 
from the end of the old Troy Highway mm. where uh, John Lewis you know, grew up and would take the bus via the old Troy Highway into Montgomery, etc. Um, so, yeah, I mean, a lot of those also growing up as a kid in the 80s, you know, my parents would – I was fortunate enough to grow up with a basic working knowledge of the civil rights movement. I mean, it was pretty basic, but it was something I kind of took for granted until March Book One came out that this was something that all kids grow up with, uh, you know, learning along alongside other things. Um, and so, I, yeah, I was able to just kind of like – adapt and, and uh, inject components of their own memories as, you know, like young middle class white people who were kind of oblivious to what was going on on their back doorstep, you know. Um, and uh, yeah, it sort of helped fill out the picture in its entirety. You know, at the beginning of that response, you mentioned how the your um, some of the art style choices that you made in uh, The Silence of Our Friends kind of prepared you for this. And that actually leads into some questions about your your style and the choices you make in in march um especially in terms of that gray wash uh that you use and the and your your use of light and shadow um you know and as as an example one of the one of the pages that really struck me uh in the in book three is the the moment where um where uh john is looking for he's he's in the search party looking for uh uh, Turmer Goodman and Cheney, um, the three missing, uh, workers. Right. And you, you, you draw this full page of him just saying the word no. Uh, it's, it's mostly black because again, he's, he's using a flashlight at night. Uh, but the effect of that was so, um, I mean, that, that, that page was so effective. And part of it too is that the gray wash is kind of, spotted into the um the word balloon um and so that that page in particular really struck me but it also struck me as kind of something that was working throughout the book this use of light and shadow and that use of the gray wash so i was wondering what you know when you when you say that is something you brought over from the silence of our friends what is what did you see about that that made it particularly effective for this book well in general, speaking about my style, uh, for a couple of years, I had, <clears throat> you know, like, I'd say in the most general way, my standard style is still deeply influenced by Michael Golden, Arthur Adams, Barry Windsor Smith, um, a lot of like late 70s to late 80s superhero artists and peripheral superhero artists. So I get pretty hashy. <laughs> I, like, I like my textures, but still in my mind, when I'm drawing comics, I'm trying to be Arthur Adams. Huh. Uh, so, but what, you know, especially when I was doing any empire, which I was inking during 2009 to early 2011, huh. I had arrived at a point in which I still liked being feathery and hatchy, but I could see a lot more contrast happening. My open spaces were getting more plain and open. Uh, my, my dark black spots were getting, richer and blacker. Uh, but the hatching was becoming more even, uh, it was having a feathered end to it, but really I recognized what I was after was, uh, nice flat tones. And so I had to do any empire in silence at the same time. And to just, to kind of break up the monotony of working on two books simultaneously every day, uh, I just kind of arbitrarily chose the gray washes. And then immediately I realized a, that it worked as a period piece. It helps our brains bridge the gap between what we know historically through watching black and white news footage and photography. Um, but stylistically, I was like, oh, this is kind of what I've been going for all along. Like, it doesn't feel like I've lost any detail, uh, but applying these relatively flat layers of tone is kind of what I've been afraid to do this whole time when I've been hatching the shit out of everything. <laughs> um, so that was probably the greatest benefit. Um, I tried not to be too dependent on the period piece aspect of the black and white, you know, the gray washes, but it was definitely an important factor. I realized that it was to the benefit of the story that allowed us to stay in the zone of the 1950s, the 1960s. Um, 
generally speaking, I feel like, you know, March was like whatever, 600 pages or something. Mm -hmm. And I had gotten consistent enough that by the third book, I was looking to loosen up again, however possible. And so, yeah, with that, with that page in particular, where John Lewis is looking through the swamps uh, and on this hopeless quest, and there's another splash page that's about 10 pages in at the conclusion of the Birmingham bombing scene um, yeah. where uh, very liquidy you know, gray drips and clouds are beginning to mm-hmm. overtake a lot of the lettering. Um, some of that was just the desire to loosen up and to be able to have unpredictable things happen on the page and roll with it in a way that I was very used to in a pre-March world. I was trying to keep the pages in March from being too codified and restrictive and having to look a certain way. But also, I'd say you have that first splash page from uh, the end of the bombing. There's the grandfather of one of the victims at the in the Birmingham church. And the, the, the quote from primary sources is, in fact, that you know, he was so upset and frustrated that he said he wanted to blow the whole town up. And we were trying to figure out how to punctuate that line, how to letter it, what were the ways in which we can – basically a show-don't-tell moment, in which we can convey mm-hmm. his emotional quality and we can convey the content of what he's saying without it making it look like we just made it up or like it's being sensationalist or exploitative. Uh, so first I took out the exclamation mark. And I decided we're going to feel the tone, though we're going to understate the lettering. And then it's still – the word balloon still looked a little too suggestive. I don't know. It looked like it was setting up a, a tone that was a little out of bounds, even though it was historically accurate. And so to me, uh, I thought that it made more sense to have the smoke – and the blood within the environment kind of threatened to overtake what he was saying anyway. I wanted to put uh, what was happening with him visually and experientially at odds with what he was saying. Um, so that's where I decided. That's where I decided to start clouding in those word balloons. I went backwards and had the had the smoke sort of encroach on the word balloons on the previous page. So when I got to the hopelessness of that search party scene. Um, that was just one of those moments where I, I knew that it worked previously and I was going to go for it. Um, basically having John Lewis being swallowed up by his situation. That That's interesting because I'm looking at the, the page with the, the church bombing scene that you, you describe and noticing also that, and I didn't notice this before that the, the I'd and I'd like to blow up the whole town is lowercase, which also uh, has, has, you know, again, a, a very subtle effect on that that moment. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, in general, I I prefer uh, a lot of this. I think is my early mid nineties, uh, like underground music sensibility. <laughs> but I, I kind of prefer all undercase letters uh, whenever I can. Uh, but I know that for a lot of projects I do, that's not a possibility. But so <laughs> anytime I'm able to increase the dynamic in lettering quality so that I can make more space for all lowercase lettering. I think it serves a very powerful purpose. Like it's subtle. It's easy to do. Um, and, uh, yeah, 1993 me gets very satisfied. <laughs> anytime I'm able to go full under case. I just, I just want to say that the, the lettering in March straight across the board is amazing. And probably one of the, you know, most, uh, of effective and, uh, emotional, you know, as far as the emotional impact of the book, the lettering really carries mm-hmm. some uh, some weight that you don't normally see lettering do. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I think lettering is kind of like the missing. It, it's eternally the underrated component of comic storytelling. I mean, you're you're not going to be able to be fully immersed in a in the experience of living inside a comic if you can't uh, dwell within the lettering as a part of the visual storytelling too. You know, also, uh, getting back to your style, you mentioned something a moment ago about the, the earlier pages, and I think you described uh, part of the look as, as liquidy uh, at one point. You know, when, when I think of your art, 
um, for instance, being introduced to your stuff with, uh, like, say, Swallow Me Whole, Any Empire, and then, you know, the early work that you've collected last year, and, and you don't say. I think of, I think the word liquidy is is appropriate. Uh, <laughs> I would, I would use. Um, like line movements that are swooping, kind of fluid, and a lot of this comes out in, I mean, not just your work as a whole, but definitely in the March trilogy. Uh, we see it in the word balloons when people are speaking. We definitely see this with song and sound, the way that mm -hmm. it kind of flows over, at times even oozes from one mm -hmm. panel to the next, from one page to the next. And I'm wondering if you consciously adopt that kind of style to connect events that take place in different locations, one from the other or one to the other, which happens all the time in March, and then uh, regarding memory, going back and forth between past and present. Uh, yes. Uh, one of the, I, I think, the most immediate way that sort of the, the swooping dynamic quality is used is because, I, you know, like, I'm constantly kind of I constantly kind of watched myself while drawing March because I knew that I knew how March as a comic could turn out poorly. And so we all knew we had to avoid certain staples of like the kind of stale historical account that a nonfiction comics memoir could have. Um, and so a lot of that had to do with control of time, like knowing that, you know, when things needed to be slowed down. And, and paste in a, a more grid style manner, giving it space to do that, but allowing pages to really read quickly when necessary also. Um, yeah, I tried to continue pushing whatever unwritten code I have about the way I use panel borders and gutters and whether margins and gutters are black or white, whether panels or borders are feathered or vignettes or not, uh, to kind of bridge those time hops or those geographic hops. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's just a lot to juggle, especially when you get to the third book, like there's so much happening that, yeah, being able to clearly establish that you're shifting location or shifting times, but doing it in a seamless enough way that people are like, Oh, just able to hop over to the next scene. That's where, that's where you, uh, you know, potentially, lose a reader by making them reread an entire section. So, yeah, I was, I was worried about that component. Well, on that topic, um, about worrying how not to make it seem too comic book-y, I guess, <laughs> uh, when, when the three of you had the initial conversations about this project, how things would look visually, what are some other, let's say, potential pitfalls that you really did want to avoid? Uh, well, to me... And I hadn't really factored in like the violence, the physical violence really escalates um, mm -hmm. in book two. Uh, so I had the script, I had the original version of the script that was for the entire trilogy as a single book. But in just thinking about what became book one, the physical violence wasn't really something I was worried about yet. It wasn't at the forefront of my attention, but about 50 pages in, um, and actually I've, been having to think about this the last couple of days because uh, my four-year-old has made March Book One her bedtime read again. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, but there's one panel in Book One that I won't let her see. Um, I'm sure she's looked at it when I have said goodnight to her already. I'm sure. <laughs> but it's the, uh, it's the panel about 50 pages in of 14-year-old Emmett Till's body being pulled mm, yeah. from the river. And when it arrived at that point, uh, and, and there are, you know, there are police photos or coroner photos of what his body looks like. Um, and I knew that that was sort of the deciding moment. It required, it was one of the first moments that required its own conversation about content, um, in which we decided that. You know, like I knew that I couldn't clean up this visual of this per this young person's body, but I knew that I couldn't make it w look any worse than it looked either. Um, so the idea was to like get the idea across in a very a very almost coldly accurate way, but without seeming clinical and without seeming like I'd cleaned anything up uh, and without kind of exploiting the the nature of the visual and its context. 
Um, and I kind of lucked out on that first one. Um, and uh, I was like, okay, I need like everything surrounding this. I need to take notes on and apply it to every sensitive situation like this, uh, forward. Uh, but starting in book two, especially when the physical violence is better documented and the harshness increases exponentially, um, it was, uh, a pretty conscious process throughout to kind of, I don't know, confront and subvert everything that I had learned my entire life reading comics and the way that works with the, you know, like the visual language of physical violence. You know, we all read, we've read comics our whole lives. We know how violence works in comics. Um, and I mean, there's, you know, there are these violent real life accounts that are also visually action packed in March and so I was trying to avoid everything that Jack Kirby had taught me, you know, and everything that Frank Miller had taught me throughout my life uh, about violence in comics, again, without cleaning it up and without uh, having, yeah, like an exploitative lean to depicting that violence. So that kind of got worked out with the Montgomery uh, – bus station massacre during the freedom rides in book two, um, understanding how to make action packed scenes work in a way that didn't feel to me like the way that I had been reading fight scenes my whole life in a book. And when it was done successfully, it actually made me repulsed at the violence that I was having to draw in these books though it was no, you know, it was like tamer than so many things I've read in so many comics throughout my life. Um, it was amazing because suddenly I realized, you know, suddenly there are these parts in March that should read as horror. Um, and uh, it effectively like resensitized me to violence in comics or visual depictions of violence. Um, also being a dad and having two young kids, it was sort of, that's a whole other train of thought there. But uh, um, <clears throat> yeah, basically it made me like physically repulsed at the things I was drawing. Uh, and so I, that was kind of the feel I was trying to, to get each time I had to depict something that was brutal was without pushing certain buttons, letting it become repulsive of its own accord. That That's really interesting that you talk about the violence that way, because when I think about the, you know, the historical, many of the historical events that um, take place in March, uh, especially the ones that are kind of uh, that are covered in in the media at the time. So, so so many of them are about exposing the American public to the reality of the violence from uh, you know Emmett, Emmett Till's mother deciding to have an open casket funeral to what we see in in book three, uh, you know uh, Fannie Lou Hamer's testimony yeah. on um, uh, on the broadcast on television. And that led me to another question because that Fannie Lou Hamer testimony is one of the moments where you 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 choose not to depict the violence except in her words. Um, was was there a conscious choice there to not say you know use a like a flashback sequence or something where we have her voiceover narration and then the visual representation of what she went through versus you know what the television watching audience would have seen at that time. Well, you actually that because of the structure of it, the structure of it on TV, but also the structure in the comic, uh, I had, cause there are a couple of moments where she's quoting the, the cops mm -hmm. around her at the moment. So I, going into it, I assumed that while she was talking and I already, I'd already done this earlier in book three, I assumed that I was going to have a quick, like one panel aside that was my imagining of, of this cop saying with his own word balloon, what she was recalling him saying. And then jumping back to her, uh, I had, I had kind of decided that I wanted to lean on just keeping the camera on her. Mm -hmm. But once I ch once I realized there was no need to hop around and have the cop speak for just a panel, uh, then I realized that if if President Johnson was going to be cutting off this uh, this TV feed anyway, then it was more important to the story to keep tr to have the reader 
viewing her the way that the TV audience would be viewing her. So we don't, we, I didn't want to be cutting away three or four times to do these descriptive flashbacks and then have the TV cameras cut away because we've, as readers, we've already cut away several times. So mm-hmm. it was important, except for when Johnson is watching in the White House and he's like, what's going on? <laughs> yeah, it needed to be about Fannie Lou Hamer sitting at that table in front of everyone speaking. And there are a lot of parts in, in the third book that are particularly wordy, not just with the captions, but with the dialogue. Um, and a lot of phone calls that needed to be included in almost their entirety. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, yeah, there are only a couple spaces where I actually hopped out of that particular room at that particular time. Um, and I don't know, that was one of the bigger challenges of the third book is like knowing you couldn't really cut much, but trying to be like, okay, are we just going to power through all this dialogue or all these captions? Um, let's, let's hope this works. It's funny that you're mentioning this scene almost in the exact middle of book three with Fannie Lou Hamer. Um, I couldn't help but think of the uh, recent HBO uh, All the Way uh, with Brian Cranston playing LBJ. Uh, have, you, have you seen that, Nate? I haven't, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. Uh, it, it's really interesting because that's um, – uh, I think that's a key scene in that documentary. And, of course, the way that it's handled is from a different perspective because you get to see it from LBJ's point of view and how that really affected him. Uh, but I find it curious that you inject some of the, that comedic element uh, with him on page – I'm looking here at 109 uh, – looking at the set screaming, God damn it, are you watching this? Um, and so to, to, to a certain point, there seems to be uh, a moment of slight levity at this very serious uh, 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 event that, that, that's going on. Uh, is that something that you consciously worked in or is that something that I'm perhaps misreading? Well, I, <clears throat> I do think there is a – I mean this is the part where you know laughter is powerful because on a basic level, it indicates discomfort. Uh, I mean, that's, that's basically how comedy works. Like comedy at its core, it functions on irreverence, if not disrespect, which is why people laugh when you're faced with like a resolution to something that has made you uncomfortable. Um, and I'm not speaking about this being comedic, but, uh, yeah, what he says is straight from the script. And so with the level of research that Andrew and Lee were doing to like make sure their T's were crossed and their I's were dotted by this third book, uh, I've, I've got a good amount of faith that he has, there's a primary source log or document uh, that establishes that. But uh, I think it's the kind of – yeah, the kind of anxiety and discomfort that might produce a little levity in that moment – comes from the fact that we are seeing President Johnson in his house <laughs> watching this on TV, also being the president and trying to figure out how to manage this situation in real time. So, you know, you kind of have to take those words as coming out of his mouth at face value. <laughs> where, like, I mean, he's like, whatever level of shock at the situation that Fannie Lou Hamer is, is setting up in her account it's you know it's completely overcome by the fact that you know like god damn it at this moment we need to shut this shit down um so he's in a crisis management mode and really i guess that's where you see regardless of where someone stands politically or morally or ethically uh he knows that his as president you know his primary function here is you know in all of its nastiness, you know, is that he needs to reclaim control over the situation, uh, which I really, I think that underlines the, the total dynamic between the movement and President Johnson and President Kennedy to, the, to that extent uh, during all this. You know, Kennedy just kind of tolerated the movement. He was kind of, in my opinion, it seemed like it was very, it was inconvenient for him. Mm-hmm. He wished, you know, it could have come more slowly at a more convenient time. You know, he was potentially down with it. He wasn't as down with it as his brother was. Um, and so that tension between brothers was very important. But LBJ was more down with the movement, but still, you know, he wanted it to be on his terms. There were ways in which it was a constant inconvenience for him. Uh, 
and he he was trying to basically convince people that like, see guys, I'm on your side. Just uh, let it be the way I say it's going to be. <laughs> um, so I like that that was this moment where he realized that it was being taken out of his hands by the people effectively. Yeah. Yeah, I guess, you know, calling that scene a moment of levity or even comedic, it, it's almost unintentional comedy. And maybe oh, that's yeah. just my feelings of, of LBJ. I mean, I think one of the reasons why I've always been fascinated by him is that f- it, it, he seems like a I – mean, he's such a problematic democratic hero uh, oh. that you mean you have I – mean, I may have issues with him. But I'm fascinated by what he does, and it's his personality and his character in the way that that's worked into the history. It kind of butts heads against uh, the historical moment, and, and we see this again toward the end of the book. And and, and I loved this scene where uh, Representative Lewis, who wasn't a representative at the time, uh, goes to see – uh, LBJ in the White House and <laughs> uh, Johnson's conversation with him uh, about uh, what he has to do now is to get those folks registered. You know, just like the bull gets on top of a cow, you got to get them by the balls and you got to squeeze, squeeze them, squeeze them till they hurt. <laughs> and then Lewis leaves, you know, it seems all confused in the way that yes. you represent that and then just leave it there without any explanation whatsoever, I think is quite effective. <laughs> Well, I get mean, yeah, LBJ is a, I mean, like, what a personality. You know, like, clearly he can't be anyone except who he is, which is what makes him such a fascinating public figure. For that particular scene, um, that actually, that was before March Book One came out. It wasn't in the original version of the script for the whole trilogy as a single book. But we were, it was our first event where all of us were together. It was a, the ALA conference in Chicago in June of 2013. And we had done our first big event together. And we were eating pizza and just talking about stuff. I think maybe we just wrapped up an interview. But as we were saying goodnight to the congressman and about to head off, it was Andrew and Lee Walton and I. Uh, and we were just asking a, a question or two. Um, and then, yeah, Congressman Lewis busts out this this anecdote about that morning, <laughs> the way that you read it in the book. Um and you know, none of us had ever heard this. Andrew hadn't even heard it, and he'd been working together with Congressman Lewis for years. And it's not in any history books. We're like, what? He's, like, yeah. <laughs> He's breaking out these ball jokes all the time. And I knew that. LBJ was like he's a flasher, an exhibitionist. <laughs> uh, like he's got this. He has this. You know, the fact that he's like making a bunch of like ball jokes and ball gestures did not surprise me. But I like that as being like the amazing like underside, you know, the the anecdotal underside to these chapters in the movement. And as soon as we heard that story, we're like, that's the kind of stuff that has to be in this book. Um, and there are other moments throughout March where we realized that if if the book was being taken seriously as histor- as history and as memoir, that you know we had a responsibility to. Not, not only just uphold historical accuracy, but there were some moments in which we've been able to actually correct standing errors in the historical record. But that's one of these moments that is relatively inconsequential, but it appears for the first time in the historical record ever, <laughs> as far as I know, in March Book 3. Um, and we're like, man, what a gem. So glad we're able to get this ball <laughs> joke out to the world. Well, you have got to see Brian Cranston playing LBJ in all the way. Oh, I want to, yeah. You, you've mentioned a few times that um, when you guys first started this project that you had a certain idea about how to work, and then that may have shifted a bit after the publication of book one. I, I'm wondering, in, in terms of your art style, what are some of the other things, uh, in addition to what you've already mentioned, that you decided to go back in, if, if not um, – let's say redirect in, in books two and three, then perhaps wish that you had done a little different in first book. Sure. Um, well, I'd say one of the things was, well, besides issues of like character consistency, you know, like that's just a natural thing where it really took until the end of the first book before I re- I realized how my own visual shorthand of John Lewis and Diane Nash uh, and James Bevel and Bernard Lafayette was going to be, and Dr. King, 
uh, that's just natural stuff. And I knew that there was no way I was going to go back and tweak those old versions, even for an omnibus that would come out later. I was like, no, that, that's just the way I drew it. That's what happens when you draw comics. You know, if I were to be drawing, you know, a 20 issue run on Wolverine, the same thing would have happened. Uh, but stylistically, yeah, I think I, I had a pretty heavy hand admittedly in that first book. Um, and the script was good. Andrew also, you know, will admit it's the first, it's, it's the first comic he ever wrote. It's the first book he ever wrote. So I kind of entered it knowing that and then recognizing that I was going to, I mean, I'm a fairly, I enjoy being given a pretty wide, uh, you know, swinging room, I guess, as the visual artist anyway. But I, I was fairly heavy handed in terms of taking the, taking the script and repacing it entirely based on my own, my own needs as a storyteller. Um, the more important thing than the visuals, than the pacing, because I, I like that the pacing in the first book is a little more reliant on the grid. There's still a lot of splash pages that are nice and still, but it, pays more of an homage to the Martin Luther King and the Montgomery story comic from 1957 mm -hmm. in that I allow myself to do six panel grids a little bit more, uh, to do four panel, uh, more like widescreen comic flows though. By the third book, I started really getting into widescreen cause I, I reread Frank Miller's daredevil run and I was like, man, <laughs> this, you know, like this run of comics established everything for the entirety of the eighties into the early nineties. And I was like, so impacted by his use of the five panel widescreen format that I was like, Whoa, in the most, in the weird, the most unexpected political uh, alignment shakeup, March book three is being more heavily influenced by Frank Miller than any other <laughs> cartoonist. Um, however, um, I'd say that in that first book, I definitely did my – I did a good share of like chopping up script in terms of captions and dialogue and making it work for a comic. However, you know, and there are a lot of decisions I made caption-wise where I was, you know, in some ways functioning as a – as like a ghost co-editor, but I was just basically running with it. Uh, the dialogue, however, required a shift in perspective because I was doing the same thing to some awkward spots in dialogue, which I will mention – because one way in which I've never worked on a collaboration like this with writers is that it took until I was almost done with that first book to realize that the original incarnation, the source material for the script was not a written word at all. That in fact, you know, John Lewis is a lifelong oral storyteller. And so some of these stories he's been telling a certain way for 40 years or longer, you know, um, I believe he started telling the chicken story publicly around 1970. So that might be one of the oldest. Um, once I, especially once we started speaking together, but I, you know, I had watched a couple of clips of him speaking as well and read his memoir, etc. And w once I realized that not only that there was a precedent for the way he was wording things, but there was a sanctity to his words as an oral storyteller, that even though there were moments in which it didn't work as well in a comic, uh, that I had to respect the sanctity of a lot of that dialogue or the captions as they're coming out of John Lewis's mouth. Um, so a lot of it was moving backwards, reinstituting the older versions of dialogue and captions in, in a lot of cases, and then seeing how that lined up with the artwork. Uh, but once I realized that was the way March works, uh, and Andrew has always been very good and very consistent about like, first and foremost, we've got to keep it in the congressman's voice. Um, so we worked all, we worked those kinks out. So getting into book two, we, we had clicked well enough as a creative team and we knew what our MO was, uh, particularly with voice, et cetera. And we were able to really just run with it. But yeah, that was the biggest change that happened as a result of, uh, doing that first book was I kind of had to have a reckoning with my own assumptions about what I was able to just run free with. 
In this relationship with the other two, because of your background in comics, do you felt that you were turned to constantly, especially early on, as you know the comics guy? Uh, did did people defer to you on a number of choices? As far as I remember, well, you know, like Andrew is a lifelong comics nerd as well. Uh, it, you know, it's his it is his first comic to write, but you know, he was coming from a place of knowing and breathing and living comics like me. Um, so I definitely had faith in him and obviously in Staros and Lee uh, in that regard. But in terms of just the core creative team of Andrew and Congressman Lewis and I for that first book, the way I remember it is still pretty much that I was given a lot of free reign. Um, and it wasn't until, you know, like once it was more or less done and I wasn't under any kind of a rush to finish it. I think I finished it in late February and it didn't come out until the next July or August. Um, so, and we didn't realize it was going to be a huge hit. So there wasn't this amount of pressure to have a final version to start spreading around, et cetera. So I remember the editing and the redrawing process as being pretty casual, uh, and thus the process of drawing the book, I was pretty much just in isolation, having a good time. I would, I was constantly in touch with Andrew about reference or details or, you know, asking Congressman Lewis a question about a particular moment or detail. But as far as I remember, the drawing itself, uh, that the first pass pre-edits um, was, was just very, very smooth. One of the things, kind of getting back to that experience at Ohio State, was that um, that was hap- that that event happened as the the Ferguson protests were going on. Right. And my original question was about this kind of historical range of the you know of the production of this book, but um, a, a lot seems to have happened in you know the contemporary world in which. March seems more and more relevant, uh, especially its its strong message about um, nonviolent protest, and almost as a as a kind of instruction guide for that. Um, kind of taking into consideration uh, where we are, I guess, in uh, in in our uh, culture and our politics today. Um, what do, what do you see as you know March's a role in that world and has that role kind of changed over over the course of writing this book? Oh, very much so. I think that's from the creator's standpoint, speaking for all of us, that's been the major theme is as the second book has moved on, recognizing that people are using it as a way of learning first uh, and then adapting our process of producing the comics based on that. Then moving into the third book, the fact that people were not just using it to learn, but using it to act and grow. It was becoming one of the standard reference points by which people were absorbing this information and applying it. And, and a lot of the echoes and the parallels, especially in the third book, you know, we'd have these moments where we'd check in with each other about news that it was unfolding that day as we were drawing. And, you know, like in general, it was the kind of stuff where we realized like, we didn't have to do anything extra to make people connect the dots between 20, 1964 and 2016. A lot of it simply had to do with laying it out in a very plain way. Um, but I'd say that, you know, like March, it's now taught in almost every state in the country in, you know, anywhere between elementary school through college. Um, and a, a bunch of a bunch of colleges and a bunch of school districts have started adopting it as their, you know, first year read or required mm-hmm. read for middle school, um, which is, you know, amazing on the immediate level. I'm like, whoa, this is incredible. But then when I recognize the kind of the way that things have really picked up, particularly since the New York City public schools adopted it uh, officially starting in May for this next school year, um, and watching other conversations develop for for other school districts who are about to announce their adoption um recognizing that like in like the people have simply had enough and mm-hmm. we're, like we, after we were on Rachel Maddow and we had this giant sales spike and we sold out of every single book in 24 hours um we're like what's happening i mean we're basically just asking ourselves like 
why? Like it can't, it's not just Rachel Maddow. Like we got a big sales. <laughs> the other times we went on there too, but I had to be like, well, I think to be just to be really genuine here, the people have just had enough and we're all hungry for answers to our questions, but for some sense of continuity that we're not living in this island of despair and like, this level of like living in a bizarro world where all this stuff is happening, um, locked into a sense that we're, you know, like we're trapped. We want to see other examples where this has happened, where other things have worked in response. Like people just want answers. They want something to absorb that they can move forward with. Like we, none of us like feeling that we're trapped in our world or in our lives. I'm like, you guys, I think like this is a moment where people are able to actually absorb some of that with our books. And I think this is a real like word of mouth moment where people like this, this did something to me. You should, you should read it as well. Um, so I don't know. We've kind of a year ago, like Andrew and Congressman Lewis started adopting a slightly more revolutionary rhetoric when we would talk about March. Um, and with this third book, a lot of it is like, we're very interested in, you know, like this is about talking about 2016 almost more than it's about talking about 1965. Um, and it, now that the work on the book is done, it's about what you do with those books and what you do with that work, uh, to move forward. Uh, so that's what we're most interested in doing is yeah, pushing that component. The fact that it, it is embracing the fact that it is being embedded so much more deeply into, our schools, our libraries, our culture as a means of discourse about the world we live in. You know, Nate, I think it'd be safe to say that uh, the three March books have uh, meant something for your career that your other work <laughs> may not have uh, impacted as much. Perhaps. Uh, and, and so I'm wondering if you feel – you know, given that the the third book is now out, if you have through this experience been branded in such a way that you're going to be feeling the weight of the March trilogy with all future work, well, the the answer is somewhat depressing, but <laughs> it's actually I mean this in a very positive way. Anybody who works in comics knows that comics is a zero sum game, and like it's still like it's a tiny pond within the relatively small pond of book publishing, you know, but like, it's such a small world. And like in the last 10 years, comics has gained a new level of footing with itself as a community. And a lot of that even means that like, I truly like, there's truly no difference between big two creators and, you know, mid-level indie creators who all have the same like day-to-day -day problems with, you know, hustling to make a living, at this relatively materially unrewarding, unsustainable art form, you know, as a means of making a living. Um, there has been zero. Yeah. But basically I'm not worried about the, the weight of the legacy of March, uh, in that it's already been established over the last three years of the March books being out. That there's been zero increase in sales in any of my other books. It, <laughs> oh, it's no. unusual because, like, when we talk about it, we're like, it's interesting that like a majority of people who read March Book One are probably being forced to read it because it's for school. <laughs> we're like, we need to like recognize Captive that captive audience. It's an unusual moment in this the life of this particular comic, um, and it's amazing that people come back and, and feel compelled to read Volumes Two and Volume Three. Um, however. You know, I feel like as a cartoonist, just in dealing with the realities of the work I do, uh, you know, I've fully accepted that it doesn't mean that anybody's going to read my own books or whatever. Um, so it's a matter of like, I have, you know, like I have two kids, I own a house now, and like, it's a matter of like the day after I finished March book three, checking up on half a dozen four higher books that I had in the chamber to see which one I was going to be able to start on soonest. It really does come down to the practicalities of just making a living. Um, and I'm fortunate that I get to work with my friends who are writing these books. Uh, my own books are super weird and you know, I never, ex they'll, they'll sell their five to 20,000 copies forever and that's it. 
Um, so in some ways I've been kind of set free. Like I know that nobody, nobody's going to care in any different way about the weird graphic novels I make from here out. Uh, so it's nice to kind of remember that that's my home planet is like, <laughs> you know, living and working in relative isolation about this story that some people will respond strongly to and other people just won't read. And, uh, I'm like, Oh, right. A cartoonist life. That's what it is. <laughs> um, so yeah, in general, I feel it's a relief. It's like there are, you know, any anxiety or misgivings about it or strictly have to do with being able to pay bills. And, uh, you know, I'm just, I stay disciplined. I schedule far ahead in advance and I'm always working on other for higher projects. And so that's my problem. And, uh, yeah, in general, it's been great. Hmm. Well, what can you tell us about your next book cover? Sure. Uh, cover takes place. I actually started working on it like 2009 or 2010 and I had to put it on, on the back burner as I was meeting up with the increasing demands of March, which wound up being a very good thing. It's over the last four years, it's gotten to be a much better book. Um, <clears throat> but it takes place in 1979 in the Ozarks in Northwestern Arkansas. And largely there are two strong components. I mean, it's mostly like it, it's kind of like a weird twilight zone slash Ray Bradbury story. Um, but it involves this like intentional hippie village 10 years after its heyday where there are still some stragglers trying to live the dream up in the mountains. And uh, the main character is a mom and she's like, you know, she's in her late twenties and she's having this affair with the dad of her kid's best friend. And she's friends with everyone in town. So these are, these are her friends as well. But a lot of the themes have to do with secrecy, privacy, and intimacy, and the lines separating these. Um, also, the extent to which people try to um, try to cover their own tracks, or if even if they're not directly responsible for something uh, for something bad happening, when people try to to separate themselves from that sense of guilt or or culpability. Uh, a lot of times they make things dirtier and messier and become more guilty in effect. So there winds up being, I mean, the only plot point I'll really say that complicates things is one of these kids winds up going missing inside this cave. There's a secret cave on the edge of town where everyone thinks they're the only person who knows about its existence. Mm. But a bunch of people from this little village use the cave for whatever their secret or private business is, whether it's for a romantic illicit rendezvous or kids exploring uh, in in the cave systems the way that kids do or people using it for religious purposes or whatever. Um, uh, the other half of the book really has to do with the way – really has to do with parenthood and the shifting levels of priorities which occur. And a lot of it is moving from a sense of like self-interest of like the main character not really not getting uh, the level of of self interest she has in her own affair, but then once matters get complicated, recognizing that like for other parties involved, it's a very clear cut decision. You have to do what's right. You know, you have to do what what you need to do for your kid or for your family. Uh, basically, coming to terms with the fact that you give up eighty percent of your life when you become a parent, um, and it sort of follows that path of just cutting off those peripheral components that fill up our concerns and our anxieties in life. I'm well, looking forward to that. And uh, I just want to say to you, when you were talking earlier about the educational use of March that, um, you know, now, now that it's completed, uh, I assume there would be plans for uh, putting all three volumes into a single, like you mentioned omnibus. Yes. Volume. Uh, that, that's great, and I'm looking forward personally to be teaching it uh, awesome. myself. I'm in South Carolina, and um, feel like it would be, you know, it would be a great opportunity uh, and place to be to be teaching that that book. But also, just wanted to say, as I we're coming close to wrapping up here, that uh, you know, in, in my lifetime, this is you know really one of the most moving and effective 
uh, graphic novels I've ever read, and a lot of that has to do with your art and your art being able to capture the the emotional impact of uh, John Lewis's experiences. So thank you for that. Well, thank you. I very much appreciate it. I mean, it was it was a tall order, but I'm really glad that I was I was able to deliver the goods in as well as I could. Oh yeah, you filled it very well. Uh, and, and Nate, we want to thank you for coming on the Comics Alternative and, and talking about March. Oh, of course, anytime, anytime. So we're here now with Andrew Iden, one of the co-creators of the uh, trilogy March, which just uh, finished its third volume. Uh, Andrew, along with uh, Representative John Lewis and artist Nate Powell, put out that series. So thanks for joining us, Andrew. Oh, well, thank you for having me. Yeah, welcome to the show. I'm excited. It's good to talk to you guys. Oh, great. Thanks. We're, we're excited to have you, too, uh, because we, we've been talking about March, I think, all three volumes have come up on this show when we've uh, when we've talked about them, and it's it's a series we've been really excited about. And once uh, you know, when when I was reading the third volume and getting to that last the sec- one of those last pages, and and Nate puts at the bottom there, uh, two thousand nine to two thousand sixteen is the the time period in which March was was being produced and so on. It made me think about that that time period in our hist- in our recent history and so what i wanted to ask you to start out with is um you know how did your vision of march especially its kind of purpose uh change over the course of that time that you were working on it over those 7 8 years well i, I when i first asked the congressman about it i asked if he wanted to write a comic book so mm-hmm. it grew quite quite substantially in size but you know, we started this before there was a Ferguson. We started this before Trayvon Martin. We started this before the Supreme Court decision um, or Citizens United. And it was um, still the same mission when we began, which was teaching nonviolence, telling the story of the movement, and hopefully inspiring young people to activism and to engagement. So that never changed, but how we did it changed with what we were experiencing almost at every level. Um, you know, the it, it's crazy to me to look back on book one and realize that, you know, the, the first 10 pages of that were written in April of 2010. Um, and almost, you know, verbatim onto the page. And when I think about like when I was sitting there actually writing them, you know, and who that human being was for myself. Yeah. Um, it's like, I don't, I don't know him anymore. Um, <laughs> he was a different person. And I think for the work, you, you can't be around everything that's happened over the last seven or eight years and divorce yourself from the emotions, the impact on what's happening around uh, our society mm-hmm. and still be an ar- artist or be in touch with the art at all. I mean, it's just, it just becomes a part of your own DNA and you're telling a story um, and finding that you're, you're offering up reasons why some things are happening and you never thought that would be what you were doing. Um, I think it's impossible to understand the politics of today without understanding the civil rights movement, but I had no idea how that would come together. Um, so it's, it's, it's both a size and relevance shift. Um, but at the end of the day, I think the purpose, the mission, what makes March unique has always been John Lewis um, and telling his story and the story of his colleagues. You know, uh, you, what you just said there reminded me, especially when you, you were mentioning at the beginning of that, these different events. Um, I was lucky enough to see see you and uh, Congressman Lewis and Nate at Ohio State around the time that I think book two came out. Uh-huh. Uh, but also Ferguson was was 
ha- you know, the protests in Ferguson were happening and there were people in, I remember people in the audience asking questions of the congressman about that, about, about how to use nonviolence in the types of situation those protesters were facing. And it, and it just really struck home with me just how important March is uh, in, in that world we're, in the world we're living in. I appreciate that. Um, we tried very hard to make it as much of a roadmap and a blueprint as we possibly could. Um, I think the congressman's always in a tough position when anybody asks him what they should do because what non what the the brand of nonviolence that the congressman preaches is um, something that is creative on an individual level, so that these groups um, find their own unique tactics. But have to, but having understood the fundamental principles, and so he becomes a guide to another generation understanding these principles. And his answer is often something that um, is is tough to hear because it puts the uh, burden of creativity back on the individual activist. And there's no outside answer for them; they have to find that creativity. And that that's a big part of what we tried to show in March was how um, you know the sit-ins led into the stand-ins, which you know, led into uh, the freedom vote and which led into, you know, and it just, it's a continuous progression of tactics that you have to innovate to be able to challenge the uh, injustice or the policy or the law that you're trying to go after. So, you know, over the, I guess, almost eight years now of the creation of the March Trilogy, you know, you had mentioned that there were racially significant events, you know, political events, cultural events that, you know, of course, at the at the start of the project, you couldn't have anticipated, like Ferguson. And, you know, even the not so racially tinged, such as this summer's uh, congressional sit-in that Congressman Lewis uh, helped to lead. Um, I mean, how do these moments or how did those moments in some way, maybe even indirectly, figure into the writing and the completion of the trilogy? Well, I think in particular the Supreme Court decision in the uh, summer of 2013 um, uh, against the Voting Rights Act uh, influenced a great deal of how much of the mechanisms um, within the the Selma movement in particular, but also the Mississippi movement um, were directed in such a way that it felt systematic. Um, We talk about the right to vote today and what was given for it and and people saying it's not needed today. Um, You, you have to pull out those threads so that people understand um, the similarities of what's happening today to what happened um, mm-hmm. under Jim Crow in the South. Um, anything that's being done to make it harder and more difficult for people to register and vote is an affront to the memory of the people who marched and in some cases died during the Civil Rights Movement. Um, symptomatic of that are many other um, broad-based challenges and locally focused challenges because I think underlying so much of what's been going on is the inability of people to be fully represented by their government. Um, And that starts with whether or not they can register and vote. Um, And so, you know, it's... It's still part of the mission, but we definitely changed to focus on that. Um, now, what is how how have you responded to or thought about the reception that March has received over the course of that that time period as well? Uh, you know, by the audience responses you've got, the people showing up at at events, and so on. I think um, we're seeing more and more teenagers, college students showing up at events. Um, and the reaction from them is, is one that I didn't, you know, I mean, I grew up in Atlanta and I was 
um, exposed to the civil rights movement frequently um, just by virtue of living in the city that was Dr. King's home. And yet I never knew the story of SNCC. I never heard the story of the young people, really. Um, and and to be honest, there wasn't much of a curiosity among my peers, particularly while I was in school. And when you go out and you go to these schools, but you go to these libraries and you go into the community, you go to book signings, you go to comic cons, there's a, a hungry young generation that is coming up and talking to us and digesting the books and reading the books. Um, that I, I don't think people fully expect it. Everybody's like, oh, March is to explain the civil rights movement to kids. But honestly, because we go into such detail, we're speaking to a generation that's 20, 30, um, 40 years old who have at least been exposed to comics. And in some cases, this is their first one. But it's it's different. It's somehow special to the readers in such a way that they haven't been touched by another work about the movement in the same way. Um, and, you know, a lot of that has to do with how unique John Lewis's story is. And for so long, it was not one of the central narratives. You know, we, we have this thing that's, that's called the nine word problem. It was a term coined by the Southern Poverty Law Center. And it means that most kids graduate from high school only knowing nine words about the civil rights movement. Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, I have a dream. And I think when we look at what March has done um, for the, the school system already, I mean, I, we just had San Francisco announce last week that they were adopting it. New York has already announced. we got a bunch of smaller school districts. And I know of a few more who are going to announce this fall. Um, it's, it's sort of fixing that problem, but we still have a generation that, I mean, is 40, 50 years old. I mean, these folks who didn't live through it, who think of it still as these black and white newsreels, um, and, and think of it as nine words and that that's all involved and they can't connect the dots between that and today. And I think the reception has, has been, you know, beyond anything we could have imagined because we're connecting dots for people. We're helping them see the connections um, in things that affect them that they didn't realize why it was that way. That That's a really interesting way to talk about it because I guess, you know, being in my late forties, I would fall into that, that kind of group you're just, you're describing there. Um, and, um, and, you know, I think one of the most effective things you did uh, choices you made in this series was then to frame the um, frame John Lewis's story with um, President Obama's inauguration. Um, so, could you talk a little bit about you know the effect that you were you were trying to get with that framing device? Well, first, let me say how much I appreciate that because when book one came out, everybody thought it was trite. <laughs> <laughs> what the the Obama frame? Yeah, because it's so much – I it, it has to be heavier in that first book, right? And when people were reading that first book, they're just seeing it as a standalone and then they don't have the the breadth of work done yet so that they can read it and see it as how it fits into this bigger, massive 560-page thing. Um, and so like, I understood it totally and it just sort of had to take the attitude of – just wait for the Aretha Franklin scene at the middle of book two. Right? Like that's that's your payoff right there. It's not the inauguration of Barack Obama, although that's important. This emotional catharsis to get you through the Freedom Rides was Aretha Franklin singing. Um, and I'll never forget, like, sort of coming up with that idea, um, like, just imagining it in my mind and kind of tearing a little bit, you know, like you're seeing the cinema of the scene that you're designing. And then you just sort of hear Aretha start singing and it just ah oh, just killed me. And then when Nate took that and he put the um the the pictures of like the little small squares of different people fighting and, and being beaten and, and everything they were going through, um leading into then the Molotov cocktail. Um it was just amazing. And it really came together and it was sort of like why you do this. But you know, there's a bigger reason um i mean i think the 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 peripheral reason is you sort of look at mouse right and like 
it, this is the closest thing I'll ever have to a book talking to my father, you know? Um, and so there's that level of it, but there's also a marker that I was very conscious of, which is that there will come a time when everybody who's alive or who's in school at least in the next few years will have been a have only known there being an African American president. Mm -hmm. And somebody had to put down a marker to say what it took to get to that day and then contextualize the importance of his presidency. Um, and I think it was a little bit of a long game play, right? Like what if Barack Obama had turned into a terrible president <laughs> <laughs> and this book would be totally irrelevant. So in some ways, like we bet the farm um, that he would be someone that people would want to remember. And boy, did he surpass us in that way. Um, but it's about people understanding how much it took just to get there. So that when, when, when we talk about today, Oh, we, we, we still have, you know, problems between, um, races and genders. And it's not a, uh, it's not a fully formed or post-racial society or something like that. You're like, no, but we've made incredible progress. I, I, as much as we may feel right now, um, that, that we were sliding back, it's like, no, in fact, we haven't, um, in some ways. And in many ways, it, it's actually just a reflection of, of us being able to see clearly many of the problems we have. Uh, police brutality being illuminated by cell phone cameras and, and just the ubiquity of the internet and people um, being able to transmit images and videos um, with with no problem. So um, to me, there is also the personal side of that day. Um, I, I really did staff him that day and everything that's depicted in there, like that was a real moment. And if you look at book three, at the scene when the congressman uh, walks into um, Statuary Hall before Barack Obama signs a note for him. And I don't actually know if it made it in the final version. I'm pretty sure it did. You look up in the top left-hand corner, uh, and there's there's somebody standing up in what looks like the rafters. And that was where I was during that, and that's where I witnessed it from. Um, and so I guess I felt... I shouldn't be the only one to have seen that day from where I saw it. It, it was a, a moment in time in which, for whatever reason, you know, sort of the congressman would call it the, the spirit of history. Um, I got to be there and I got to see it. And I wanted to put that on the record, so to speak, for everyone else who, sh who, should know what that was like. Well, you know, another big payoff uh, in terms of using the inauguration of President Obama uh, in this trilogy it comes at the very end of Book Three, where after the inauguration, uh, on, on the last page of the comic, you and Congressman Lewis are talking, and um, he references, you know, that comic book idea. Uh, and, 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 and I love this because, I mean, here is the, the self-reflective move in this book, right? Because, you know, everything up until this point was the history. And then we get in, in this final page kind of a send-off that tells us, well, this is the actual genesis of this project here. And, and I really appreciate that. I'm curious, though, when um, Congressman Lewis is saying that, you know, I was thinking about that comic book idea. Apparently, this is something in 2008 that you guys had discussed at some point. So I'm curious, I mean, at what point did you first broach the topic of a comic book idea with Congressman Lewis? Well, that was the summer of 2008. That was six or eight months before the inauguration. I mean, I had the idea when I was on his campaign. Uh, I was serving as press secretary. Um, that's the first time he told me uh, about Martin Luther King and the Montgomery story. Mm -hmm. um, and it was sort of after that that, you know, John Lewis writing a comic book seemed almost self-evident. Why wouldn't you do that? And, you know, you know I got I got laughed at uh, pretty good uh, about that idea. <laughs> um, but I, Laughed at by know. Congressman Lewis? Uh, no, he was a good sport about it at first. You know, he was sort of he said, well, maybe, which is, you know, a nice way of saying no. Um, 
And, but, but like the staff was pretty much, you know, they did not like that idea. <laughs> now, now you wrote a thesis about that comic, right? Yeah. I just had to prove my point. <laughs> <laughs> so did that, did that happen? Where did that, ha- that writing that thesis happen within this time frame you're describing? I, I finished that thesis uh, in October of 2012. Oh, wow. Um, okay. Yeah. One of the things that I would suggest never doing is writing March and working on the Hill and going to grad school at the same time. <laughs> that was, I mean, it's a wonder I, I survived it. But, you know, I think, you know, busy people get a lot more done in some regards. And, and that was sort of um, what I was doing. But, and trained me for the March tour, man. Like I thought my hours were bad then. Like this is nuts. <laughs> uh, but you know, so so I wrote that thesis. Actually, we'd already had the. Uh, this is where people kind of get confused on it. I'd already had the idea um, for March and was actively working on it. Like I I tried to sell. I started trying to to write proposals and sell March in two thousand nine. Probably that summer, by the summer of two thousand nine. So like four or five months after the inauguration. Um, and like just kept going around and around with it, uh, until I finally found top shelf in 2010. Um, so there was this long period of time and then I started grad school the end of 2009 and then there's this break at the end of 2010 because I went and worked on another campaign. Um, and it was super weird because like, you would tell something about yourself in grad school and then you'd, I'd be like, oh, I work for John Lewis or something. And they're like, well, what's something weird? And I'd be like, well, I'm writing a graphic novel right now. And people would be like, <laughs> ah, ha, ha, what's that? You know, and they were just they, like, nobody had any idea what March would become really. But, but I remember being like, no, I think this is going to be something you'll hear about. And people would be like, oh, cool. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> um, and I, like, I remember my grad, well, so I had to take this seminar before I did my thesis. So you take this seminar on how to write a thesis, which, you know, you have to do it. It's not a lot of classes, but you have to do it. And I remember sitting in that class and they're like, and you present your idea for your thesis in front of everybody. And I get up there and I say, well, you know, there's this comic book. Here's a, here's a copy of it. And I, I kind of, I want to figure out who made it. And that'll be my thesis. And I can write about the, you know, Congress and comic books and the context of it and about the civil rights movement and all that. And my teachers were like, well, do you, do you have any other ideas? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, no, I think it's going to work. And then I had to explain March in front of the whole class. And everybody's like, look at this nerd. Oh my God, what are you <laughs> doing? Just stop embarrassing yourself. And so, but like, I, I, I just, I wouldn't take no. And so Finally, they, they, they agreed, and then I found a thesis advisor um, who was 110% behind the idea. And then, of all people, Eddie Campbell started helping. Huh. Um, you want to talk about bringing in a cheat sheet on a <laughs> comic book history thesis? Yeah. Just have Eddie Campbell there to answer questions for you. Because I, I met him at Comic-Con, and like, like Eddie and I are like actually like friends. Like We are the like same kind of weird in some ways. And uh, I just saw him at San Diego and we had breakfast and then we ended up – like I, I was the perfect day. I started it with breakfast with Eddie Campbell and I finished it walking home with Eddie Campbell from the dead dog party. It was awesome. <laughs> um, you don't have better days than that. But but he showed me sort of like how to understand 50s comics um, mm-hmm. because – the, the commercial market, like like we think of 50s comics and it's like, oh, hey, Supergirl came out. But Eddie walked me through how to understand who printed it, what the format was. Like the way we figured out how to tell a first printing from a second printing of Martin Luther King and the Montgomery story was because of the staples. I never would have thought <laughs> – I'm like looking for the Indicia. There's no mention. and like, But it's things like that that I had no way of knowing but um, – I, I was really fortunate and it's, you know, again, the congressman sort of calls it the spirit of history where it's like there was some sort of guiding hand being like, yes, this is a good idea. You stick to it and then 
here's some help. Um, and what we ended up finding out, which was crazy, is that Martin Luther King actually helped edit the comic, Martin Luther King and the Montgomery story. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's just, you know, Martin Luther King, comic book editor, like that just blows your mind. Right. <laughs> um, it, it, you know, I honestly humanized it, him to me in some ways, right. You see him almost as like a deity and, and I'm just imagining this guy in his study pouring over his script. Um, he, he, in his letter, he said, I'm sorry, I would have edited to you sooner, but I, I, my wife gave birth to my first child. And so you're imagining him with this like newborn child in the other room, and just his whole life swirling around him and what is about to come. But he, but he's helping uh, edit a comic book because it's important. <laughs> and yeah. um, it was just, it was amazing. And then we found out a bunch of other stuff about who made it. We actually had to use the congressional. Uh, <laughs> this is so weird. Um, we had to get the testimony from the congressional hearings uh, that, into comic books from the 50s. And everybody had to list a mailing address for the companies that testified. And one of the companies who uh, was a part of, I think he put in a joint statement, it was a guy named Elliot Kaplan, uh, who was Al Cap's brother. And so he listed the address of Toby Press because it was one of the ones that was attacked for having you know romance in the comics. And, and it was a little violent. Um, I think they had like vampires or something. And so we were able to figure out the mailing address on the letterhead between the Fellowship of Reconciliation and this company that we'd never heard of um, and match it to Toby Press so that we could figure out that Toby went out of business and it reopened as a commercial comics manufacturer. Mm. Right? Like super nerd. I mean, it was incredible. Um, And it's like my closest i will ever come to an indiana jones experience (laughs) so um and so then it was like i had like this groundbreaking research in some ways uh oh and sylvia Rohr from carlo university she was really helpful too she had written an article about dahlia zieda who was a a, uh um young muslim woman who translated martin luther king montgomery story into arabic and took it to egypt and the revolution and so um you know we had all these stories and these unbelievable things and so we put out this article the week before march book one came out that we the congressman and i again with the masochism and the work um we also guest edited an issue of creative loafing which was our weekly newspaper in atlanta um which is an amazing publication is i think sort of the the backbone of atlanta in some ways Um, and so we were like, they asked us like, hey, would you guys want to guest edit an issue? And we were like, heck yeah, we would. And so we made it into an issue on the future of nonviolence. And, um, you know, the, the staff was incredible to work with. And they really like they did a lot of the heavy lifting and they just really put it together well. But the, the feature article was a shortened version of my thesis. Hmm. And so we were putting all this research into print. Right. And it was like. It went citywide and people were like, oh, a comic book played a role in the movement? Oh, my goodness, you know? And then uh, just, it just sort of opened the floodgates where it allowed us to answer the question right out of the gate whether or not it was dignified for John Lewis to write a comic book. Mm-hmm. So that the answer was absolutely, of course, Dr. King already edited one. Why are we even asking the question? Mm. You know, And so – in in that one fell swoop with the release of book one, Colbert having it up on his show and doing that exact sort of thing, talking about Martin Luther King, the Montgomery story, we, we, we sort of knocked down any question about whether or not comics could be at this level, whether the congressman could do it or a civil rights icon or it could play a role in a protest or it could actually inspire young people. Um, and, and I think clearing that out first is sort of what allowed us to come out of the gate and just be a thing right when we started. Hmm. Now, you know, I, I've had the good luck of wor- of being at Ohio, the working in the Ohio State Billy Ireland Library at the same time as Eddie Campbell. Oh, wow. uh, and he was doing he was doing some research on uh, like turn of the century sports cartoons. And so what you were telling me there just reminded me of just like what an what an omnipath he is in terms of comics history. Uh, and you know, you know he, he was just doing this deep dive into something that you know nobody yeah. has written about sports oh, he's cartoons. A, he's a uh, genius, and and everybody should consider Alec and Bacchus both um, mandatory reading. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which you know we've we've talked about Bacchus on the podcast. In fact, yeah. you know, well, heck yeah. yeah. Now, Andrew, you know, you're you're talking about your research on uh, Martin Luther King and the Montgomery story, and then earlier you'd mentioned that your first thoughts of what would become March was a comic book. I mean, were you thinking, and did you originally talk with Congressman Lewis about this being a comic book? Uh, I mean, something like the Montgomery story, or was this? I mean, was it something, in other words, that you thought could be contained in, I don't know, 20 to 30-some pages? No, I don't think we ever saw it as that, just because from the beginning, I imagined it telling everything from the Nashville sit-ins to the Selma campaign. But I didn't know if that was going to be... I, I originally thought of it as a comic book series. Oh, okay. Which, um, I, I the more I read... Looked at Persepolis, looked at Mouse, um, just looked at some of these graphic novels. Um, really, that became the idea. Uh, and, and that was the idea before I, I pitched anybody. It was just when I first talked to him about it, it was like, yeah, a comic book. And then you sit down and you really think about the story you're dealing with and the way you should deal with it. Um, and then, then it became a graphic novel. But it was originally one volume. Um, and then Nate maybe talked about this. It was the San Diego Comic Con in 2012. He looked at the script that I turned in, which was like 280 pages, 300 pages, something like that. Um, and he was like, yo, this is not going to do. you got to make this bigger. Um, like if I draw this the way I want to draw it, it's still going to be bigger. Um, because, you know, I, I had no experience whatsoever dealing with someone like Nate who could – do so much with just the colors black and white, you know? Um, and so it was written very much in a typical, um, six panel studio house style, um, without, you know, splash pages or profiles or any of that sort of stuff in there. And once Nate said that we started chopping it up and basically then I got to go back and rewrite everything that I wanted to rewrite with space, not being such a factor. Um, book one, I think was originally 70 pages and then it became 111 when we, when we finished, um, book two, I think, I think book two was originally about a hundred and 110, maybe like a hundred pages of it. And then, um, particularly because of Ray Arsenal, his work on the Freedom Riders is extraordinary. And so there is a depth um, that I, I was able to pull from that and then some of the footage um, for the to draw out many of the small scenes and details that could be um, used in the story. Uh, and then Nate expanded further on that. Um, and so each book was like an exercise in, in um, trying again. I guess. Um, cause it was funny. It was like after book one came out, you know, it was all of six weeks before the sort of reality set in where it's like, awesome. You just published your first book. Congratulations, man. It's number one in the New York times. Now you have to do another one. And it just all crashed down on me to the point where like you, you have a lot of self doubt. You're like, can I do this again? And then, Honestly, the second book was so much more fun at the written stage because it was like, oh, there's all these more things I can do that I didn't do last time. Um, and I didn't sort of see it in the same way as, um, oh, are you going to have another bestseller? It's there's all these other parts of the story that you're now free to include. Like, have fun with that. And then that's where um, – you know, some of this Aretha Franklin stuff really came together, uh, that scene. Um, but also the March on Washington itself was a real opportunity to showcase some of the people who, after reading their words and reading what they, about what they've done, um, that didn't get their credit elsewhere. Um, like Bayard Rustin, Baird Rustin, sorry. Mm -hmm. Um, he, was in some ways diminished, not just um, after the fact, but they were continuously diminishing his role during the movement because he was gay. And so I, I read an interview that he gave just before he died where he said, he, 
they asked him, what was the most meaningful moment of your life? And he said it was that page, that story of him having A. Philip Randolph walk in on him at the end of the uh, march and, and say thank you and then start crying. And so for us, we, we started to branch out and like include that as a single panel as our thank you to Rustin. Uh-huh. Right? And that sort of freedom, that I felt like liberated with this. And as you can tell, I really got kind of happy with this third book. Um, and, and, and to be honest, like it's so big, but like we cut pages. Hmm. Well, you talked about bringing in Nate Powell and, you know, someone who, who knows the comics medium. This was your first book. Uh, he told us when, when we spoke with him previously, uh, from his standpoint, how he came on board of the project. Uh, I, I'm curious, you know, you as the, the, the instigator of this idea and then working with Congressman Lewis, uh, how did you guys come about and choose Nate as so, the illustrator of this book? Right. Um, yes, I am the instigator. I am the <laughs> – uh, yeah, this is, this is my show for sure. Um, so that was one of those moments where we had to trust Chris Staros um, because – um, I don't think Nate even had his style for March completely fleshed out by the time he started it. Um, and so you know, we, we, um, he sent us some sample pages and, you know, of course we had, we had notes, um, because there, it was, it was a f- funny thing, right? Nate, being a very succinct graphic novelist who uses words sparingly, um, he, he would try and condense things and be like, well, you don't need to spell all of that out, right? And so he condensed the dialogue down in the story of John Lewis meeting Dr. King. And it's like, there is a word for word version of that story that John Lewis tells. And that is what I wrote down. And so we had to go back and be like, well, that dialogue really has to stay exactly as it was. Um, and then he redid it. And then he did one of the Selma pages. And it was one of the – it was the Selma page that really got us because he added a panel that was a profile that like you can't really describe on the page. And it just made the page come together. And so we – kind of fell in love at that moment with that image. Um, and that's, that's where the decision was made. And, and you know, ultimately it was a congressman's call. Um, and that was, that was what he decided. Well, it, it came together well. I mean, I think that there's, um, you know, it's Nate, Nate, as we talked to him about this brings so much to the book. Um, one of the things we did talk to him about too was how, through the the course of the series, um, especially into book two and three, the violence increases. You know, the the graphic depiction of violence increases. What were your your kind of thoughts or concerns about approaching the the reality of what um, what these protesters experienced? You, there's a constant tension between making the violence seem cartoonish and like with its sort of gross exaggeration um, and then fully reflecting the brutality of what actually happened. And I don't think we ever shied away from showing anything in its most brutal form, really, because when you're on the ground with the characters that we're following, like that's their point of view. That's what they saw. And, you know, that, that just made for a very violent book. Um, I, I remember early on talking about this conceptually and someone saying, well, it's just a bunch of sit-ins and, you know, marches. Like, there's not a lot of action. And me, having to retort, like, no, in fact, this is going to be one of the most violent books children will ever read. <laughs> and... <laughs> Everybody was skeptical about, uh, you know, and it's because they didn't know the full depth of the story and what they really had to go through. Um, and that's good. You know, if, if, if you see this and, and someone says, did you register to vote? 
where someone sees this and, and they ask you, you know, do you, do you really think nothing has changed? Um, you have a better answer now, a more complete answer that, that can come from um, a full understanding of what was really done to these people. You know, that that's interesting that you talk about it that way because I mean, it's kind of on a personal note. I just, I just recently re- renewed my driver's license in South Carolina and was looking at the – then looked at the instructions for the, you know, photo ID – the option for the photo ID that you need in order to vote in South Carolina. And, you know, Mar- March came to me while I was looking at that and thinking, oh, you know, now I really – now I understand how onerous this this really is even if it's not being articulated as, uh, you know, as kind of – as overtly – racist as the scenes we see in March where, you know, this is, this is, the story is still going on, even in something as simple as the instructions I'm reading for my driver's license. Yeah. I mean, that's a great point. You know, there's something in this country called the real ID program and it's, it's kind of broken because, um, it requires you to either have a social security card, um, or a, uh, W2, Mm-hmm. So if you're unemployed and you don't have access to um, the internet, you have to actually go to a social security office, which means a considerable cost just to get your card, yeah. which then takes weeks to get. And then you have to go back to the DMV and then wait again to get your license. And that's assuming then you can prove like everything that you need. Um, you have all the paperwork. You need all these other documents. Um, it's definitely very, very difficult. And I think you know people understand who live in their communities. And why should a college ID not be good enough? Why is it then that your um, hunter's permit is good enough? <laughs> right? So I think we've got some really out-of-whack priorities. And to call it anything other than voter suppression is wrong. Um, but that's why people need to read March because when you go and you have that aha moment at the DMV, um, it personalizes the whole issue for you. For a lot of us, we can just get by. We have a passport that we can afford to get renewed or the 40 bucks or whatever to get your driver's license is just something we can eat. But for a lot of people, that's not the case. And those are the people they're trying to keep from voting because they're going to vote for people who want to make it um, easier to grow in this country. Mm-hmm. Now, you've mentioned a couple of times in describing March uh, an, an audience of younger readers, and, and obviously uh, this book is is perfect for younger readers, uh, and not only in terms of learning a bit of American history when it comes to racial justice, uh, but um, to, you know just just reading in general. Um, I'm wondering though. Um, how you and then the the others, uh, the other creators, might feel of this book being pigeonholed solely as something for younger readers, uh, or, or maybe that's something that 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 you feel is is somewhat the case. I mean, do you think that that uh, the March Project um, is something that most people will consider? Oh, well, this is for younger readers, high school, junior high. Yeah, it drives me nuts, man. I'm gonna be honest; it just drives me nuts um, because you know I hear these people who claim, you know, who are in positions of authority. I mean, I spend more time around elected officials than I care to, honestly. Um, (laughs) And I hear them tell, like, what they think about the the civil rights struggle. And they they can barely reference the names properly, right? The the adults don't know this story well enough. Like, they're they're (laughs) – most of these folks should be grateful it's a graphic novel because – um, we can speak to them in a way that they don't feel like they're working so hard. And because <laughs> like, that's the only way a lot of these folks are going to read it. And, and it's not it's not that it's graphic novels are for young people. I mean, if anything, it's the language of the future, because this generation, they're all digital natives. And the Internet is a graphic narrative 
communications method, mm-hmm. right? Um, so, of course, our next great stories are going to come in this medium. Um, I, I won't get into the whole depth of it, but one of these well, – there's like a relatively major museum calling Nate um, and calling us uh, about – March art for their collection. Um, and I don't know if I'll do it, but it was, it was so interesting to me because it's like the avant-garde who see time differently, they get it already. They see what's coming. But I sit here and I watch some of the nation's highbrow publications um, continue to look down on graphic novels, especially ones that are not made by uh, people who are already part of the uh, cartoon of naughty. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Like there's like, there's like seven guys and they're great. Um, and, and then everyone else is just sort of nipping at their heels in some way. Um, but there's not a pure graphic novelist, right? And that's what's beautiful about Nate's talent is like, this is a guy who came out of comic books, right? It'll it'll tell you about one of his first comics. And it was, it was like, like he tried to make an image comic from the early nineties, basically. Right. And the, the, the comics that formed his, his social consciousness were Chris Claremont's run on the X-Men, you know? And, and, that's where I came from. I was I was a comics fan. I, I wasn't somebody who liked to read the cartoons in the newspaper, right? I, I by God, I love superheroes and I love all the comics I could get. Um, and and that's very much the place we came from in making March. And that's never going to appeal to the people who um, hold on to an anti comics bias so desperately because it might invalidate their superior um, view of art and literature and things like that. But that's okay. I got half a million kids reading our books, you know, like Mm. fine. Um, (laughs) Because my mission was bigger than that. My mission was about teaching and reaching these kids. I mean, I was raised by a single mom. My dad left when I was three and that's when I started reading comics. And so if getting the book into a kid's hands who's growing up like I did, who needs that inspiration, who needs a hero to look up to, means that I will never be or March will never be accepted by the um, fanciest of the fancy, the highbrow of the highbrow. So be it because that's not what this is about. This is about that kid and him being reached and him having a way out. Uh, oh, I really, I really love your passion here about this, and uh, and you you mentioned then in that in that little bit about your your own experience with with comics, and one of the things I wanted to ask you about um, is your future with comics. Uh, I had I had <laughs> seen after that. No. Well, I have seen I've seen uh, that that you're going to be writing something for for uh, Bitch Planet. Yeah. Right. Oh, I can't wait for the Capitol Hill papers to write something about <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, from March to Bitch Planet. <laughs> it's going to be hilarious. With with a side dish of X-Files in the middle. Um, That's right. That's right. Yeah. I uh, And I, I turned in a short story today uh, to the artist, uh, a guy named Tim Fielder, um, for a short story in the CBLDF Liberty Annual that comes out the week of Election Day. Oh, cool. Great. Yeah, it's about Victoria Woodhull who was the first woman to run for president in the United States yeah. in 1872. <laughs> so I'm taking this nonfiction thing a little seriously. Um, or, or at least this is, this is tougher because it's like, I mean, dialect alone will kill you. Right. Um, I, I it's tough. Uh, and so I had to go back and read a bunch of her speeches for six pages. And I'm like reading this woman's speeches from 1870. Um, but you know it's fun. I enjoy that. But but really, like this bitch planet thing could be a thing. Um, Kelly Sue has done an amazing job making something really special. Um, and Valentine Delandro is just yeah. spectacular. I mean, what a talent. Um, and so I got asked. Uh, well, I mean, if I'm totally honest, I was like Kelly Sue, I want to do something, and she was like, "You want to write for Bitch Planet?" I was like, "Heck yeah, I do." Um, and so she, I got to work with Lauren Senkovich, who's the editor over there, 
uh, milk fed. And it was just a wonderful experience um, that really kind of played into my day-to-day life on the hill. Um, and so it's satire. It's 100% satire. But um, like any good satire, you're going to see through it in some spots. Um, but And I got to sort of help design, in a way, uh, the government for Bitch Planet, mm. um, which – like that was my sweet spot, right? Uh, okay, we're gonna have a fictional government taking place in this world. Like it was like I was head nerd for that one. Like that was my game. Um, so that was like that was a lot of fun. Um, it was just it was pure pleasure all around. And so I don't know exactly how the short story is gonna run. Um, originally, it was slated to be a backup story that would run over two issues, but. Then they started talking about maybe having it be a standalone issue with an essay from Kelly Sue. I, I don't quote me on any of this. They'll make an announcement, I'm sure. Um, but uh, I think um, I think it's going to be something like that. Well, I look forward to the 12 year old kid ordering March off of Amazon who gets the notice. Uh, people who bought March also bought Bitch Planet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but. But Bitch Planet is one of those books where, like, a smart 12 or 13-year-old, like... Oh, no, would, yeah. You know? And, like, if that's what he's reading, all right, man. We're doing something right, you know? Yeah, no, I was I was but 13 years mom, old when man. American Flag came out, and that oh, informed yeah. my politics, so... Oh, great reference, man. <laughs> well, what other uh, comics projects do you have on the horizon, or uh, do you have on your wish list? Well, so I've, I'm putting out a, a book proposal soon uh, that I can't get into much, but I think it'll do well. Um, but that being said, like comics as a whole, I mean, like if I've got an action figure of that character on my shelf, like chances are I would love to do something with it. And I have a lot of action figures. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I think one of the early bonding moments for Nate and I, because, you know, everybody expected me to sort of be a government stooge when I came on. They're like, like the, like Gabrielle Ba and Fabio Moon, the first time they met me, they just started calling me government man. Uh, <laughs> so, so it took some warming up, right? You know, it took years for them to actually learn my name. Um, and so when Nate came to stay with me for the first time and visit Washington and meet the congressman for a prolonged period of time, um, he, I had a, a spare room uh, that was like a teeny tiny bedroom in my apartment. And I would put an air mattress in it. And it was floor to ceiling graphic novels and toys. I mean floor to ceiling. <laughs> um, and so Nate sort of walked into this room and you could just see him be like, oh, you're one of those. And like, <laughs> just everything changed. It was like, yeah, man, I'm pretty high on the de- the, the the geek meter. So it was, um, we were we were two peas in a pod after that. And so, you know, I think Nate and I both said we were asked somewhere like, what if you had if Team March had to reunite, what would be the project you would want to do it on? And we both kind of looked at each other and we were like, X Men. So. <laughs> Uh, I definitely like emailed Axel Alonso after that, just being like, "Hey, it just came up. Just thought <laughs> you hear about it somewhere. Just wanted to give you a heads up." But you know, that'll probably never go anywhere. I don't know. Uh, you got kind of a cachet here now. <laughs> I mean, you, you know, it, there's. Uh, I've been seeing some interviews um, from some creators who really feel like comics has taken a wrong turn. Um, that, you know, they don't like that, uh, um, superheroes are changing their gender or something like that. They, they just want them to create new characters or something as if, you know, these characters aren't mantles and, and they're, they're something that is some owned by someone, um, or even one generation. Um, and I think someone said they missed the good old days where you could debate global warming. And I was just like, come on, like there's no debate about global warming, first of all, and like I can't handle any more of I miss the good old days crap. Like yeah. people just don't get it. And so like I'm really proud of companies who are not afraid to reflect their readers and reflect a broader readership for comics. Because um these 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 kids who are reading today have characters 
that we could only have dreamed of. I mean, my father was Turkish. There is no Turkish superhero. So for me, it was, you know, and maybe they don't even have to make one for me. It was, I would glom onto what I can. It was like, I love Wolverine because he's hairy, right? Like, that's what we could, <laughs> that's what we could get, you know? Um, and, and these kids, then the way they're embracing it today, right? Like, so they got their candy and they are eating the heck out of it. They're so lucky and they're, they're just turning comics into a better place. Um, and so anything I can do to further that, to make comics as, as loved, uh, by others as it is by me, um, I'm down for it. You know, just kind of circling back to March. I mean, I think just in terms of, you know, my own, my own reading experience and, you know, the March just feels like it's such an important accomplishment and such a significant work, uh, that, you know, that, that, you know, I, I'm glad, I'm glad to hear your, your continuing interest in doing, in doing comics, but you know, that you've made a huge mark already on, uh, not only on comics, but on probably a lot of readers lives. Well, I appreciate that. Um, my mother suggested I go into hiding now and, and I just leave it there, right? Like, go out, <laughs> like, like pull George Costanza, like I'm out. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, um, there's a lot more to be done with March. Uh, this is, this is not over just now that it's out. I've never seen such intense interest in developing a property, but you know, I've never, had another property that wanted to be developed. So, you know, I'm learning, but it's just amazing to me what people think they can create because of March um, and how all the different ways we can tell that story. Um, because in some ways, the, the, the message of John Lewis cl- uh, transcends graphic novels without a doubt. But March itself was the device which destroyed the barriers and the, the rules for how it can be told. And so I'm really excited for what's to come. I think a lot of cool stuff will happen. Um, you know, w- uh, I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that John Lewis and I will do another book. Um, I think Nate is exhausted and he's been in <laughs> incredible sport. I mean, the dude did 250 whatever pages in a year, right? Yeah. Fully inked, fully lettered. Um, he he served his time and he did it well. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, I think you know if there's a really cool character out there and there's a short story opportunity, I'm pretty much saying yes to all of it. That's why you see me. I keep just doing these short stories and whatnot. And and X Files to me was um, like I actually have the tops comics X Files number one yeah. like a little framed on my wall because it was such a meaningful comic to me back in the day. Um, my mother would work and, you know, she'd come home most nights and really she was too tired to interact. I was a teenager or whatever. Um, but every Friday night, what we did is we ordered a pizza or we got a pizza from the grocery store and we stuck it in the oven and we watched X-Files at nine o'clock because my mom could be home by nine o'clock. Um, so I knew she'd be there. And so, uh, that was our tradition for four or five years, in fact. Um, and so... When IDW said, well, what would you like to do? It was X-Files without a doubt. And uh, that was a lot of fun for me. There's some references for my mom in there and stuff um, that only she would get. But it's uh, but I learned from that, too. You know, it's like like I got I, – I think that was good for me to flesh out a full 40-page fiction story. I actually had to write it in a weekend, which was nuts because I just – I don't have – like if, if there's a tough deadline, it's not like I can like say, well, I can't come into work today. Um, so I have to work around the schedule and find the time where I can. And so getting faster is something that's, that's really important to me. So I'm working on it. I, I think there's a lot that could be done and a lot that could be, um, made in comics that still hasn't been done yet. Um, but March, I mean, I'm pretty sure unless I can really come up with another good idea, March is probably going to be the first line of my obituary and that's okay. Like, I mean, that's the thing. I'm going to turn 33 on Thursday and I will have already done March, you know, and, and life's good. You know, I just got to enjoy it. Now you mentioned well, happy birthday. Yeah. Happy birthday uh, ahead of time. 
Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that you could see yourself doing another comics project with Congressman Lewis. And, and that reminds me, uh, I guess it was about two weeks, maybe a little more than two weeks ago, uh, I saw you, Congressman Lewis, and Nate on the Rachel Maddow show. And if I remember correctly, she hinted – uh, having just read uh, book three, that she thought that there was something else that could be written about this. In other words, that uh, March isn't going to be listed, uh, limited to, to just three books. So she may have not been too far off the mark. <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, John Lewis's life did not end in 1965. Uh, his career did not end in 1965. And, you know, what happened between 1966 and 1970 um, is incredibly important. And we're only now starting to wake up to it because for whatever reason, we have to be 50 years out from history before we really start to get excited about what happened, you know. Um, and I think we're approaching a lot of those anniversaries um, in May, we celebrated the 50 years since the de-election of John Lewis from chair of SNCC, uh, which, you know, nobody really talked about, but was like, you want to talk about a moment that had a profound effect on America. Talk about that moment because that is where, uh, SNCC began to slide from a nonviolent organization to a violent organization. Mm -hmm. It's where black power came from once Stokely, Stokely, um, popularize it during his time as chair. Um, it is a crucial moment of understanding. And of course that comes before, um, the anniversaries of 68. I mean, the assassination of, of Martin Luther King, the assassination of Robert Kennedy, John Lewis played a unique role, um, in the aftermath and the healing of both of those events. Um, and I think, I think that's a story that should be told, um, how we do it, what it's called, all of that sort of stuff. Um, you know, I'll uh, I'll wait until I have something firm to tell people. But um, that could be something powerful, and I think uh, powerful is what a powerful story is. What got me interested in March, and I and I don't want to stop doing things, uh, creating things with John Lewis that can be powerful and can have an impact. Well, this definitely gives us something to think about and look forward to, if that's a possibility. Wait, that was most like, I've been on the Hill way too long answer. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. But, but it's, it's, it's a, um, I think it becomes kind of self-evident again to everybody that there's going to come a point where it's like, this movement is going to grow and there's going to be ups and downs and it's not going to look just like it did before. And so understanding, um, the, the successes as well as the failures is uh, what brought it together and what ripped it apart. Um, those are two sides of the same coin and everyone's going to need to understand that. And so, um, you know, I have a lot of work to do, man. <laughs> it's like, like you sort of stare down the barrel of it and, uh, it's about patience and persistence and, and being consistent. So I'm just going to do my best and keep working hard at it. Well, you've done a lot right now, and we're looking forward to, to, to more in the future. Uh, Andrew, we want to thank you for talking with us for the podcast. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Thanks. Yeah. That was really good. I mean, not only was the conversation about the ins and outs of the creation of the three March books interesting, uh, but both Nate and Andrew were two fun guys to talk with. Yeah, yeah, that was a blast. Those were both two really lively conversations that we got to have and, and a lot of fun to be involved with. So uh, I really enjoyed that, and I hope our listeners did too. Yes, uh, it was an important uh, couple of interviews for us, and these are important books for all of us. Uh, again, March Book 3 was released last month from Top Shelf, so definitely check those out. And we want to thank Nate and Andrew again for being a part of the podcast. 
And as Andy pointed out at the top of the show, you can find all of the March books at great deep discounts by visiting the website of our sponsor, and that is Discount Comic Book Service. Go to dcbservice.com, and you will find great books there, March and otherwise. And after you do get your comics there, get in touch with us and let us know what you're going to be reading. If you go to our website, comicsalternative.com, you'll find that you can leave us a voice message through SpeakPipe, which is really easy to use. Or you can call us the old-fashioned way. Our phone number is 4153-COMICS. That's 415-326-6427. That's right, or you can get a hold of us by email. We are two guys at comicsalternative.com, and you can get a hold of us individually as well. I'm Andy at comicsalternative.com. And I'm Derek at comicsalternative.com. And we also have our Twitter feed where you can check us out at the number two guys with PhDs. That's right. You can also find us on Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google+, Goodreads, Pinterest, and YouTube. You can subscribe to the podcast through iTunes. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can also find us on TuneIn. You can listen to the podcast through Spotify and, if you're an Android user, on Google Play Music. But you can find every single one of our podcasts as well as the reviews and the comics-related commentary that we post on our blog by going to our website, comicsalternative.com. That's right. All the ways to get a hold of us, find out what we're doing, and let us know how we're doing. Yeah, and let us know what you think about these interviews with Nate and Andrew. And until then, I'm Derek. And I'm Andy. See ya.